For those of you who don't know me, I'm Mike Blake, and I'm a director at uh, Brady Ware and Company, and we are a full-service public accounting firm that is based in Dayton, Ohio, with a 65-year history of helping our clients achieve financial success. Um, I work out of the Alpharetta office, um, and I'm in charge of the local business valuation and decision support practice here. I also host the Decision Vision podcast, which discusses how to approach decision making on various executive level topics. And I host regular office hours with uh, Tech Alpharetta. And uh, finally, I publish a daily chart of the day. And if you're interested in that sort of thing, the best way to receive it is to uh, follow me on LinkedIn. And at some point, I will wake up and actually use Instagram. Um, but I, I, I haven't got there. I mean, there's just so many social media things now. Um, at, at some point, you gotta, you got to kind of get work done. Um, before diving in, I would like to thank the marketing team at Brady Ware for helping put this program on with short notice. Um, you know, we are not accustomed necessarily to using Zoom or really video and a, and a whole lot of what we do. And I suspect that's the case for a lot of people that are on this call. Um, and, and they've really done a fantastic job at, 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 um, at putting this together and getting you guys all in. So Brian Filoni and Kara Hamilton in particular have done a fantastic job. I just want to take a moment to recognize uh, the great work that they have done here and they continue to do. Um, I am delighted to introduce um, my friend and our guest, Robin Hensley, who is president of Raising the Bar. Um, and, and, and long story short, you know, what, what, what she does is that she is an executive development coach that focuses on business development and attorneys. And Robin and I got to know each other. I'm saying about it maybe a dozen, 13 years ago. I have to go back and find out. But it's, it's, it's been long enough where we know where some bodies are buried. And um, you know, I was a coaching client of hers. And, and I, think, I think one of her greatest achievements is, is turning me from a business development disaster into something slightly north of mediocre. And, and believe me, that's a long, that's a long journey. Um, so you know, I, can't, I can't recommend her enough. And um, uh, you know, many of you, especially in the legal community, know her, know what a great resource that, that she has been to the, the local business community and to people individually. And uh, she's, you know, as we say in the show business, she's a hard get. And uh, we, were delight we were delighted that we were able to get her. Um, she was recently named by the National Law Journal as one of the nation's top three best executive coaches for, law for lawyers. And by the way, I know a lot of us on this podcast are not lawyers. Uh, I am not a lawyer either, although that doesn't stop me from offering armchair legal opinions on Facebook because that's what social media is for. Um, but it's okay. Almost all the principles that she teaches apply, I think, to nearly any professional uh, service. Um, she's been named to the Daily Report's Best Of as top business development coach over the last nine years. Uh, for 19 years, she's chaired the audit committee of a public company superior group of companies, ticker symbol SGC. Uh, over the last 18 years, Robin has coached over 1,000 attorneys, CPAs, and other professionals. Um, she specializes in coaching attorneys, accountants, other professionals, et cetera, et cetera. Basically, she really knows what she's doing. Uh, I think most of you know that, especially if you're from the Atlanta area. Robin, thank you so much and welcome to the program. Um, can you uh, kick us off? Yeah, thank you, Mike. Uh, you give me a little bit too much credit. Uh, you're doing great in your marketing and branding, but thanks for having me on today and thanks for everyone joining. I see some uh, clients, some familiar faces. So uh, let me just start off by saying, you know, there was no playbook for this COVID situation, as we all know, and we also want to, we're talking about marketing today, uh, we want to have sympathy and empathy for those that are directly uh, affected by this, and we feel very lucky if we are not. So we want to have the right attitude, not just marketing, 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 but it's a serious situation. I heard it described as sort of like in Atlanta, we know black ice. Everyone knows that the fear of the weather people, and it's their day, whenever they can say, Atlanta, it's cold, it's raining, black ice. COVID kind of reminds me of that because if you're trying to drive on black ice, uh, which I've tried unsuccessfully, but you know the thing is to take it slow, and we want to take this marketing and our reviving our efforts and so on slowly, 
and you know methodically so on black ice if you slam on the brakes which many people have stopped marketing or stopped interaction if you slam on the brakes on black ice that's not a good thing either you sway and you sway but if you keep steady on then you'll be safe so this time you can really see are your are you your clients trusted advisors are you really concerned about them personally and their family in an authentic way not in a way that's putting on an act but really have empathy for them and their situations it's not the time in my opinion you'd be most surprised to market heavily and so we're going to talk today about more about that but it is not business as usual and it will never be business as it used to be and usual it's a new day and this will change the way business is done forever yeah and you know um i think the name of the game here is is adaptation right um you know what the post covid world looks like if there's a post covid world you know it's it's really unclear but living in the here and now as 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 beings that that evolve you know we adapt to our environment and this is now a new environment to which you know we must uh, or should adapt if we want to continue to uh, to enjoy enjoy success so you know let, let me start off with this question i i, I find it amusing that i, I see article after article, post after post of, of things that people are or should be binge watching on Netflix during this period. I mean, I don't know, I don't know about you. I don't know who these people are. I don't think I've ever been as busy as I am right now for no other reason because the things that I'm used to doing now take twice as long because I'm having to relearn how to do them in a different way. Um, but, you know, uh, What's your view on that? Is this an opportunity? Should you know? Are, are you finding a lot of people are treating this as a forced vacation and they're they're binge watching at you know the Tiger King or updating their LinkedIn bios or you know what what what's going on with that and what is the mental posture that we ought to be taking? I I think some folks might have done that the first week or so and just hoping things get better fast, but I think as time goes along and my clients are certainly Type A and motivated is that you know we're trying to get all the work done though that we had to start with and so a lot of people are catching up but now they're saying hey we need to reach out we need to see what's going on with our clients and so you know it is it is time to uh, get on the move hopefully we'll come today with some concrete examples of things that you can take away today that might work for you though in getting back uh, say on the ice so um, you know, and, and to that point, um, there's, a, there's a widely held belief um, that the economy is going to come back. And I don't really know what comeback means. I think everybody has a different view of what comeback means, whether it's getting back to what it was like on February 1st or, or, or something else. Um, why not just sort of sit back and, and wait for that to happen? Well, there are people that, that do wait for ha things to happen. There are other people that make things happen. I certainly hope for revival, at least in my stock portfolio, which is another one of those things like in 2008 that you really just don't want to look at. Um, but uh, there, are, there are folks that have, uh, really are looking and seeking for ideas about what to do these days. And I think folks have generally woke up and say, hey, I'm going to have to do more business with video conferencing and we all jumped on zoom and you know we're learning as we go we are as well but i think that there'll be a lot more uh video conference meetings than there were before uh, especially due to all the traffic in atlanta as well so it is going to change and it has changed the way business is done um now of, of course there's a there's a, a growing sense that things are changing, things have changed, and, and there are probably changes coming down the pike that we, we can't fully conceive of yet. But let's, I find it comforting to, to talk about what hasn't changed, what can, we, what can we fall back on, what is a grounding point that we can use that, that is frankly timeless, right? I think there's a, there's a, there can be a tendency for a type A personality, um, not that I'm one, I'd probably be better off if I were more of a type A, um, 
but at least to say, you know, no matter what happens, these one, two, five, nine things are, are, are going to be the same and, and use that then as your platform for whatever it is that we're going to do going forward. Are there any, any, any sort of those timeless principles you think that are just not going to go out of style? Certainly, especially with professional services, which most of us are in on the call. Uh, people do business with people they know and like. I'm sure that whatever profession you're in, there's others that are uh, CPAs as well as you are, corporate attorneys like you are. Uh, there's always someone out there that purports at least to do things as well as you do. And so it's, it's really time to take a look and say, what is the unique proposition and how can I really concentrate on my client and how I can help them rather than closing the deal? And this can include really now at this point, you might have an extra minute or two to learn about your client's industry. I think it's really amazing about the board that I sit on, Superior Uniform Group, even some of my best clients and best uh, colleagues there do not know what Superior Uniform Group does uh, and so on. Not that they need to, but if you were marketing to me, it would be really good if you knew something about the call center industry. So I think now is a time that we can step back and reach out and get to know our clients more personally if they will let us. Again, are, are you the trusted advisor? Are they in contact with you now? And so that personal approach. People don't give their tax returns to two CPAs and see how both do with the same document and compare the results. As you all, all know, selling professional services is selling an image, is selling authority, expert, but people have got to like you. So now is the time to really reach out. Your clients may be cocooned as well, uh, but at least you've reached out to them and you are also learning about their industry, trying to do things to help them, such as a webinar for the general counsel's department on a certain subject that you can do now, complimentary, that people can join on a Zoom call. What does your client need to make their job easier? You know, and, and I want to I want to drill down on that because I think that's a I think that's a really important point. I, I've I'm coming to the conclusion that one of the impacts of this, this COVID episode is that it's, it's going to draw a premium on some kind of specialization. Um, you know, in, in a crisis scenario where if you're on one side of the barbell where your business has jumped 300%, right, and you've had a fire hose jammed in your mouth and turned on 100% blast, um, that, I mean, for a lot of companies, that's a welcome problem, but it's still a, a significant problem you got to solve. Um, and on the, the other end of the, of the barbell, you have companies that either have seen demand drop 30% or have been legally compelled to cease operation, right? Which is a, just uh, is incomprehensible that that's happening. I'm, I'm not saying that that's a good thing or a bad thing, but we can all agree whether we agree that that's a good policy or not the notion that that would occur to us would have been inconceivable just about everybody three months ago. Um, and you know, I, I don't know that generalized knowledge is really going to cut it in terms of, you know, helping somebody work through and react to an extraordinary crisis like that, right? This is the opportunity and the demand really, I think to become very knowledgeable about the ins and outs of the industry, because the way every business is going to respond and, and react and be impacted by this, by this COVID it is, is going to differ by industry by industry and probably company to company. I, I don't see how you can mass market, mass produce, have some sort of cookie cutter um, um, kind of approach. So if, if you've been, if you've been thinking about, if you've been thinking about, do you need to specialize or not? Uh, you know, I, I think for many people, this is a good opportunity to use that as a platform or a motivator to do that. Um, 
So talking a little bit about downtime, assuming that, 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 that people have some, and I think, I think some people do, um, you know, unfortunately it's, it's probably in real estate. It's hard to, it's hard to show people new houses right now, though houses are being sold. So I may not be right about that. Um, but I have spoken to other individuals who are sitting on their hands a little bit. Um, it's hard to be a litigator right now because the courthouses are, are not closed, although I, I understand they're now starting to hear arguments by video conference, but it's still not a full capacity. Um, you know, if you do find yourself that you, you do have professional downtime, you know, what in your opinion is the best way to, is the best way to use it? Well, I believe, John, in industry focus, uh, you know, for 19 years, and uh, things like the construction business, the manufacturing, and so on, a lot of my clients, though, when I start with this conversation with them, say the second session, they're horrified because they're thinking if they specialize or have emphasis in and all the special knowledge of one of these industries, then people are not going to call them about the other. And I've never seen that happen. Back in a previous life, I was an owner in a large general contracting firm and vice president of marketing as well as principal. When accountants and lawyers came to sell me things, and I being in the contract or general contractor's business, uh, it would be clear to me with their terminology and the things that they were asking me that they had no idea of how business is done by general contractors, which is quite different both in the accounting and legal world. So to know uh, what the difference is, at least between concrete and cement, and to know some terminology like big dumb boxes uh, and things like that to the industry, show your client that you're interested and knowledgeable. And as a business owner, I wanted to hire a lawyer or an accountant that understood my business, or at least some of it, if they didn't understand it, they were trying to understand it. So I think that's very, very important in the sales process, much less focused and concentrating on a particular area uh, for your clients, being technology, which you can speak to, uh, Mike, quite a lot. Well, yeah, and segueing into technology, I think one of the, the most obvious shifts we're now seeing is, is video now being a big part of our uh, a big tool, frankly, for, for all of us to use. And, you know, it's funny, I mean, video, video phone calls have been around since the early 1960s, AT&T displayed it um, <clears throat> with about five frames per second at a, a World's Fair, I think it was in like 1963, something like that. But, you know, it's really never taken off and Apple kind of nudged it that way with, uh, with FaceTime. But you know, even I doing as much as I do in the tech community and being a tech geek really didn't do a whole ton of, of video. And even now my preferred media is podcasting because I have a face for radio and even podcasting is better because it's unregulated. But we're all having to kind of learn to love the camera a little bit, aren't we? Absolutely. And, you know, I used to do my share of pitch coaching at Kilpatrick as their our uh, first director of marketing at Kilpatrick Law Firm here. And when you're doing a pitch via Zoom or via video like this, as you know, it's just a whole different deal. Um, so how about your experience? I, I don't get the sense that you were necessarily a big Zoom video conferencer before, say, March 1st. What, what has your own experience been learning how, to, learning how to, frankly, love the camera? Or do you love the camera? Is it more of a love-hate relationship? Well, I've had a national practice, I guess, now for about 15 years. So I've coached attorneys uh, in 33 different states and accountants as well. Currently, I've got clients in Hawaii, Dallas, etc. So I was using Skype doing that. And it is a little bit uh, difficult, as everybody knows here, uh, to uh, capture someone's attention and keep someone's attention say right now, I'm sure some folks are looking at their junk mail email file. Uh, it's more difficult to do so in a large environment as this. I really like the one-on-one -on -one video conferencing because I'm into saving my clients time. I'm totally into helping them make more time to do high quality marketing and not be traveling around 
uh, the Atlanta traffic to uh, make it to my office. So, you know, we've all done some of it, but Mike, you're right, we're now doing a lot of it. And so I've been really studying on YouTube, and YouTube, there's what, you know, something on everything about communicating through video. Also, SpeechWorks and SpeakEasy, which are companies here that do professional speaking training, and I'm sure among others, are gearing up to do uh, seminars like how to think and speak, you know, in your seat, as well as on your feet. And I took that course from SpeechWorks. I don't know if you can tell that. But again, um, you know, being heard, having a, the power, your personal powerful presence comes through on video is something that you just need to work on. And you need to work on it, by the way, not talking with your client. And as you go, you need to practice this with your partner at the law firm or your spouse or someone other than I'll practice live, you know, on screen. Yeah, you know, um, learning how to use video for me, ha I mean, it has been surprising to me how hard it is. For example, as I speak to you right now, I'm looking into the camera so that the people viewing this think that I'm actually talking to them. Um, which means that I'm, I'm not looking at you really because my camera is not positioned that way. Um, and I can't look at my, my script and my questions, my notes or anything like that. Um, and, but you know, doing that is weird because I feel like I'm speaking to a robot, but I know that the user experience on the other end demands that I behave in this way. And that's not something that comes natural and, and you kind of have to learn it. Um, I think something else that comes through on video and Robin, I'd love you to comment on this. You know, as you know, I do a fair bit of teaching, something I, I enjoy doing quite a bit. Uh, and of course, teaching now is being done via webinar. And uh, it's, it's a different animal. E even if all you're doing is throwing up PowerPoint slides and, and leading people through a set piece of content, um, I, I have found and I, I, I'm relieved that I'm learning this from other people who are professional instructors, tenured professors and so forth, that, that the energy required to deliver content by video is maybe three to four times greater than it is to deliver that same content in person. And, and, and even having a video chat for whatever reason, I don't know why that is exactly. I'm sure there's science behind it but it is, it's, a, it's exhausting to me. Um, and, and I really sort of, you know, after I have a call, I, I quote, need a minute. I'm curious, have you sort of found something similar? Absolutely, let's take it. Most of us on this call and most of us in professional services are introverts in a way. Um, I majored in accounting. Uh, we've got a lot of folks here that major in, in obviously the legal side of education, we didn't check sales and marketing as our major, our PR. So we are really having to jump. And you know, at first we say, yay, introverts unite, awesome. We don't have to go to a networking meeting, a work the room and so on like we usually do. But now to communicate in even a similar way uh, on video as we do in person, it's, uh, it's really a new skill. Now, another trend that I'm noticing, uh, and I, I want to get your comment on, and it's interesting, this actually came up with a podcast that I recorded yesterday um, with a friend, Brandon Lisi, who is a, a, a marketing, longtime marketing professional, and I, and I learned candy store owner, um, uh, talked about the need to also kind of be adaptive in the services that you offer as well, because the you know, what, what you're selling and the way that we sold it, the way that we offered it, provided it three months ago, right, may, may just not be as relevant as it, as it was. And, and it, it, it gets down to this, this, new, this new vocabulary that we have had introduced, which is what is an essential business and by extension, what is an essential, uh, an essential service. And, you know, it, to my mind, it's, it's, it's very hard to sell something right now that isn't immediately or easily apparent that it's essential, right? You're, you're not seeing people spending right now on the nice to haves, would like to haves, wouldn't this be neat and cool to have? 
but it's got to be positioned as 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 a gotta have i think i mean where do you where do you fall on that do you think i'm i'm off the reservation on that or do you think there's there's some truth to that oh absolutely um we've got some mediators uh joining us here on the call and they're still doing mediation but uh certainly in a new way my wilson estates attorneys uh getting a signature on a, a document there can be a challenge much less notarized and so doing depositions you know by by video we've always done some uh but to really go exclusively to that um, has really been a challenge for folks to be creative about how can they provide their services in a high quality way in a new medium. Yeah, and, and, and that's interesting. I want to I want to riff on that a little bit. The, the the notion of of mediation, I would imagine. I don't know this because I, I don't do litigation, but um, I would imagine that mediation takes on an added importance, right? Because getting, you know, if, if you think you're going to get a resolution in a courtroom right now, um, you know, I don't, I don't know when that's going to be. Courts will open at some time. You got to, you got to have a court functioning court system at some point. But you know, if, if you thought you're going to have a May or June trial date, <laughs> I, you know, that you're, you may be thinking November best case scenario and, and maybe one of those alternate services, right? Is, is, Maybe you try to help mediate, maybe not an official mediation way, but you you are going to pivot maybe from from straight litigation into trying to broker some some kind of deal. And that's a, that's a crude example. I'm probably messing it up, but you know that that to me sounds like one way that that you know, one segment might might pivot. Um, in my area in in business valuation, you know, people aren't as interested right now in figuring out what their business is worth, right? I mean, they're not. You're not selling unless it's a fire sale, generally speaking. There's a little bit of activity going on, but M&A has really ground to a halt. But what clients really are interested now in now is risk management and forecasting and helping them figure out kind of what the path forward is and how do you measure that, how do you track it, how do you, how do you shepherd that in a very detailed way. So, you know, we're, we're having to pivot our services as well. Um, you know, one... I want to go back to video for a second because there's another part of that that discussion that I think I think warrants covering, and and that is um, I wonder if the coronavirus leads to an opening of the door for a comeback of a much older technology, which is the telephone. Um, uh, I historically have not done a ton through telephone. It's just faster to type things. And in the tech community, people don't historically want to get on the telephone. They want to email things. They want to tweet things. They want to do things through instant messenger, Slack, whatever. That's fine. Right. But I, I see kind of the telephone making a little bit of a comeback here that people want to just get on the phone, talk to somebody because you can dial a number. You don't have to set up an appointment. You can just pick up the phone and call somebody with Zoom and most video conferencing cannot yet do. Um, Robin, I'm curious, are you finding that as well? Is, is, is the phone kind of getting a, kind of making a comeback here a little bit? It is, but I've always found that it's hard to build relationships with emails. And so you have to though follow your client's lead. Uh, lawyers say to me, when the phone rings, it's always bad news. And so some folks are more comfortable uh, talking on the telephone or texting, email, and so on. Follow your client's lead. But what I do know is that people just generally, even if it's a pleasant call, don't like unexpected calls. So, Mike, you were saying about reaching out to set an appointment. What I do and coach my clients to do is to reach out and set up an appointment via email or text to say, Hey, I'd love to catch up with you, especially if it's a referral source for you. We need to really keep in touch with our other professionals that work with us jointly, you know, for our clients. And so if you reach out, though, to send an email and say, hey, can I call you this afternoon after four or tomorrow morning at nine? And so this gives a expected call because, as you know, it's really hard to get people on the telephone. 
But I will say leaving a voicemail in your own voice, showing the emotion, the authentic emotion that you feel, uh, because they're not you know, answering the phone, but to leave a voicemail has to me a uh, more caring uh, attitude than just a quick email, how are you? I mean, everybody started out six weeks ago, emailing their client, how are you doing? Check in on you, question mark, you know, times 300. And so, you know, see if they would like to have a telephone call, what you can do for them. But what are we doing now that we're out now, four or five weeks after we made that first interaction, even if it was by telephone? So what are we doing now that is more creative in a way that we can help our clients? And, and you know, another thing about the phone, I think that that is, is attractive is, you know, you don't, you don't have to get ready for a phone call the same way that you have to get ready for uh, video, right? Um, you know, if, if I know it's going to be a phone call, they, they, they can't look at me. So, you know, if, if my hair, which I, I should have gotten cut before coronavirus hit, but I didn't. So now I'm starting to look like I'm in a ZZ top cover band. Um, but, you know, I don't have to pay as much of attention to that. And it's just not as, you know, it's not as much of a stressor. Right. As opposed to, well, you know, they're, they're going to I'm going to have a video call in a couple of minutes. I, you know, I better put my pants on just in case. So it's an extreme example, but it is it is something that you sort of have to deal with. And I do think that the, the phone does provide kind of a more casual, low stress, low key communication experience, even if you're losing the visual. And, and quite frankly, I don't think I'm adding any value with my visual anyway. So I think that's a good thing. But um, you know, I do think the I do think the the good old fashioned telephone is making a comeback. You know, even if best practices are that you know warn them that you're 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 going to be calling. Um, Mike, can I say on that that I give my clients and I'm coaching you know the choice the choice uh, if they're local here you know to yep. do telephone or Zoom with a video, and most are doing just the telephone. Because uh, video, as you say, can sometimes be a little bit confrontive as well. And so I think that the telephone is more comfortable uh, for many of my clients. But I will say that I've had many planned telephone conversations that have turned into Zooms in, in a moment's notice. Hey, let's grab a Zoom call instead. And so to be ready to do business, uh, to get up, to get dressed, even though I've got yoga pants underneath, but, uh, you know, to get up and be ready for any kind of call, uh, you know, it's really important because you just never know. Um, is it possible also in business development that we're selling something besides services? You know, if, if we're being looked to as trusted advisors, you know, I kind of have this, this theory, and I may be all wet, but I kind of have this theory that we're not just selling services, but we're also selling or offering um, a sense that our client isn't alone in going through this. You're not locked in a missile silo, just sort of waiting for the world to end or not end, but there's actually sort of somebody kind of with you. And, and, and I'll give a kind of real world illustration. You know, we've, we've had two stimulus packages that have been administered by banks. They're called the, the, the PPPs. Um, and, and, and of course, everybody's wanted to, to kind of get in on that. And, you know, and the accounting industry, our firm included, has been instrumental in helping clients uh, fill out the forms required to be eligible and to receive that, that aid. And, you know, the, the, the point has been made that, you know, why, why are our companies hiring accounting firms or in some cases, law firms to help them fill out that paperwork. It's a relatively simple form, three or four pages. Why are they doing that? And, and I thought about that. And I think, I think the answer is this, is that you, you have a business and you think like the world is falling apart and you have 19 other things that are, are existential to your business that are on your desk from how you're going to meet payroll, how you're going to make rent, um, how you're going to move inventory, whatever, whatever it is. And, and just somebody that can take something off your plate and say, look, I got this. I, I need these five things from you and we're going to take care of the rest. 
you know, yeah, clients can kind of do that themselves, but I think there's also a sense of just buying or, or having access really to a partner right now that, that you believe in and trust, I think is at least half the game where you have this kind of very disruptive, unstable environment. What, what, what do you think about that? Absolutely. Like all of our clients, we know, are not uh, lovable, if you say, but I know that many of the folks on this call, and I do as well, become very close to our clients. Not everyone, but uh, every one of our clients, but many, many are, and we do become their trusted advisor, their confidant. People tell me stuff, people stuff you wouldn't believe. Uh, but, uh, you know, if you're that kind of person that can at least reach out to do that, whether your client, you know, uh, reaches out as well, but to ask about them, their family, and to think about, you know, what they're going through, even though you are in a, you yourself, probably at your law firm and accounting firms, or sometime, and I feel like you're in a boat with a hole in it, you've got, you know, the bucket trying to keep your own business afloat with so many difficult decisions that are I have to be made and have been made in the last six weeks in the professional service community. So, you know, it's the old thing about kind of being uh, a duck on the top of water and swimming around and, of course, looking all uh, in control and such. But underneath, uh, we're just really, uh, you know, uh, backstepping and really trying to make things work both in our shop as well as our clients. We're talking with Robin Hensley of uh, Raising the Bar and uh, how do you, how do you jumpstart, restart, accelerate your business development in a coronavirus, uh, in a coronavirus environment? And uh, just as a side note, uh, just occurred to me, some of you may be more or less comfortable with Zoom than others. If you have questions, um, there's a, a, an icon at the bottom of your screen that says chat open that up and you can type in, in questions. And uh, you know, at this point, we'll probably get to them after we're done with the main part of the program. Um, but if you do have any questions, um, uh, don't be shy. On, other, on the other hand, if we're doing such an awesome job conveying information that we're literally covering everything that you could possibly think of, then that's great and we will take that as a win. Um, let me ask this, there, there are a lot of people, maybe most, I'm, I'm not sure, but certainly it's a big number of people that have made their entire, their entire career off of phys, uh, physical presence. That's the way I want to put this. That almost went very badly. Off of physical presence in, in establishing and building relationships, whether it's physically exchanging business cards and you know, going to trade association meetings and conferences and golf outings and cocktails and I don't know, horseback riding, whatever it is that people do. And, and now so much of that has simply been blown up and taken, and taken off the table. Um, how are you advising your clients that are used to that, I'll call it the analog way of relationship building um, to transform over to digital in, in a rapid way so that that digital presence become use, becomes useful quickly? Great question. One of the main things that my clients have found successful is to do introductions of folks on video. Uh, normally we connect those folks we know, and I know I'm known for that. If you're a CPA in the construction business, be introduced to, to a lawyer in the construction business. And so what we've been doing with that now, my clients as well, is to go ahead and do that via Zoom with three people on the call, yourself introducing and bragging on, if you will, the two people that you're introducing, and to be able to do that without logistically getting the three people together and travel and so on and so on. So it's really worked well. So to approach your referral sources and say, who can I introduce you to today? Who, who would you like to meet by category and so on, uh, having a list of people. So really being able to do that, yes, you're not touching them, but you're saving a lot of time and you can stay on the call for five minutes or so or the entire time. But I found that to be very effective rather than waiting and saying, well, I want to introduce you to so-and-so, 
but we need to wait. Why not go ahead and at least do a 10 minute or so conversation that's a start and then they can follow up later to strengthen that relationship. And, and you know, that, that, that opens a, 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 a broader and I think very important question, which is, you know, we, we've spoken most of this conversation about engaging with our clients, but most of us generate business by referral somehow and there are referral relationships. So you talked about not waiting until not waiting until things open up if they do, at least to the, the, the extent that we expect um, to make introductions. What are some other ways in, you know, within the, the environmental constraints we have now that we can proactively think about helping our referral sources do well? Because frankly, you know, altruism aside, it's important that our referral sources continue to thrive or we're not going to have those referral sources anymore. So there is a vested interest. How, how, do we, how do we help them and lift them up as well? Well, uh, what I've seen is uh, actually I'm part of two now mastermind groups where, uh, you know, there's a key group of folks that I have that refer me a lot of business and, and so on. So we set up a every Thursday morning at 830 call mastermind to with eight people to share, first of all, what's new and what you want folks to know about. And then secondly, what you would like for folks to look at to do for you. And so to create a mastermind of a, a little bit more than three people who are like-minded and working and referring to each other, I found that to be very, very helpful. Um, is, is the way we talk to people, is the way we cultivate a relationship different because of the mass psychology out there? I, I, you know, um, it, it, it bears expressing people are, are, not only are people stressed, they're stressed in ways they've probably never been stressed before, right? You know, suddenly my wife has been put into the role of being a homeschooler uh, in addition to, to running, you know, her, her businesses. Um, and others are, 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 are caregivers in some fashion. Others are adopting new roles that they were not anticipating. And, you know, some are, are questioning the very viability of their careers. I've had those conversations. Um, do we need to address people? Do we need to address the market differently, recognizing that maybe this, the, the, the kind of common psychology that's out there is also just a little bit different? And frankly, there may be more of a negative energy surrounding it than there was three months ago. And, and if so, how do you how do you address it? So I really sympathize, I'm not having children myself, but I really sympathize with those that, uh, one of my clients has seven children at home. Uh, and so uh, clearly that's a super big challenge. So what I've uh, seen done, Mike, and suggested doing is to get a group together to discuss how to work more effectively in your home office because a lot of folks have been thrown full time into a home office that they're not used to with printers and you know so I go 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 almost overnight so to really reach out to people to discuss things that are not the technical that are not necessarily you know the latest pronouncement by the PCAOB but to really say hey we're working at home how can we do that more efficiently and have balance how do we deal with all the other things that are going on in the background to keep our concentration up and to have an environment that we can still bill and bill is still the billable hour. And so we can really reach out and have empathy and sympathy and exchange uh, ideas like that with the people that we are networking with. Um, one thing I'm seeing more of, and I've, I think I'm, I'm personally experiencing it in a positive way, is because of the combination of video and work from home, that there are opportunities, whether planned for or not, to glean and share glimpses of our respective personal worlds with our, our business ecosystem, right? You're there in a, in, a, in a very, you know, a very well done, tightly done office, which, I mean, that, that's you. That is something that we would expect. Um, me, you're basically seeing me, me in the middle of the playroom where you see my arcade games behind me and way in the back, my music studio. 
And, and many of my clients have really enjoyed that and wanted to ask about it and learn about these sort of, you know, childish slash midlife crisis hobbies that I have. Um, what do you, what do you think about that? Where do you fall on that? And, and is there a danger of, of letting go on that and maybe sharing a little bit too much? Is there a threshold of TMI out there as well? Well, I think all you can do is reach out and follow your clients, potential clients lead. What I've done is I had a potential client, have a potential client that's really into uh, hiking and uh, all the outdoor things. And of course, uh, right now it's a little bit difficult to travel to one of the wonderful national parks that we have that he usually does. I think he's been to, you know, 40 states of, of national parks. And so what I picked was, uh, I found out a state that national park that he had not been to. And all the national parks now, or most of, have a video uh, walkthrough of the park and so on and tour. And so I set up a, a Zoom call with, uh, with this person, a lunch. I uh, actually had Grubhub, you know, uh, deliver some lunch to this person at their home. And we had a working or a fun lunch, actually, during the lunch hour and looked at this beautiful national park. So I think that you can be creative and it is important, you as a personality, what you do, uh, but it's more important to know what does your client do for fun? What team are they uh, supporting? What do they love to do, play golf or those types of things? And so really to come up with something that you could propose to them that's more creative to do at this time. And, and that, that segues nicely into the last question I've got, because um, we're running up against our, our one hour point here. And that is, you know, knowing what you just described in terms of you know, what people are doing with their off time and, and then taking into account we're now in a work from home environment. Um, is that going to change the nature of, of, of corporate gifts? You know, um, uh, sending a big fruit and candy basket may not be as appreciated now. You may not even be able to do it if you don't know the person's home address and that gets into awkward conversations in this day and age too, right? But when, when, when people may be struggling to get exercise because they're, they're not going to the gym as, as they once did, you may need to even rethink corporate gifts, right? Exactly. And, and during our non-masters golf tournament event where uh, everybody had a lot of time because they were planning to entertain and so on during that time, I had a couple of people that I sent a basket to or had a basket customized uh, with, uh, you know, master stuff and the visors and so on and so on. And so um, that's going to wrap it up for uh, today's fireside chat. And once again, I'd like to thank Robin Hensley so much for joining us and giving us some great tips on how to restart and sustain our business development efforts in a COVID environment. I'd also like to thank the marketing team again at Bradyware for doing a great job of organizing this on short notice. And I'd like to thank all of our listeners for hanging in there and wanting to take affirmative action for their practices. This is Mike Blake from Bradyware signing off. Have a great day and stay healthy.